Gains, games, not gains. <laughs> That's my company name. And uh, I'm happy to be here today to join you for an hour of uh, news, of, uh, of some random topics, and any questions that you have about what's going on here at Stillmeyer Games right now. I have a, a little visual to show today at some point. And um, let, me, let me mention chocolate of the day first. I just stopped by local ice cream place Clementine's just yesterday and picked up one of my favorite flavors. They have a really fudgy vegan chocolate ice cream that I love from Clementine's. Highly recommend it if you like like fudgy pudding like chocolate almost. Yeah, it's more pudding, like chocolate pudding almost, but it is ice cream. Um, really delicious from Clementine's ice cream. What are you, what, what's your indulgence of the day, your treat or your chocolate of the day today? Um, also, I, we got a nice gift the other day from GoPo Popcorn. Um, they're based in the middle of Missouri, Fulton, Missouri, and uh, Nicholas at GoPo was very kind to send us some popcorn that includes some sweet popcorn, some salty, but mostly sweet. There's a, a, a lemon, a lime, and a cherry flavor that, uh, that are really delicious. We like the lemon the best, I think. The lemon has some white chocolate in it that makes it really, really tasty. I see a lot of people are already joining in today. Good morning here. I'll say the names of the first few. Tony, Dominic, Carol, Stephen, George... Facebook is making me scroll past certain names. Chad, almost missed Chad. Chad, I'm really enjoying your book recommendation, uh, Waystation. Reading that right now. Uh, Rick and Alex, good morning today. Garrett says that he's homesick from work today, but silver lining is that he can finally catch one of these live. I'm sorry to hear that you're sick, Garrett. That is a nice silver lining, although I'd prefer that you wouldn't be sick. Um, hopefully you're getting better soon. So I, chocolate of the day, that's a very low thing. I had a fun little uh, event this past weekend. A friend hosts an annual Low Country Boil, which um, is a southern kind of tradition in the U.S. where you have a bunch of, bunch of people over and you cook up um, shrimp and crawfish and potatoes and corn and, uh, and sausage if you eat meat um, and some other, what else am I, I think those are the main ingredients kind of in these big vats and you pour it out on the table and people just eat with their hands all this food. Uh, and it's a wonderful time. I think he had around 25 people over there. I brought some, some uh, chocolate pies as my contribution to the event. Um, and it was a wonderful time. Really, really nice day. Perfect evening, perfect weather for it at this Low Country Boil this past weekend. What were you up to? Did you have any fun social events this past weekend? Let's see. Uh, Austin says that he played Viticulture World for the first time this past weekend, and his group really enjoyed it. Excited to try the other continents. I'm glad you enjoyed Viticulture World for the first time, Austin. That's great to hear. Uh, Carlos says, "What's my view on the board game industry as of August 2022?" Do you? That's a big question. So I'm, I'm thankful that you're narrowing it down here, Carlos. He says, uh, "Do you think?" that freight shipping prices will lower at any point in the future, or is this the new normal? How about freight shipping speed? So this ties into something that I have to share today, Carlos. Um, so I'm seeing freight prices go down a little bit, um, maybe a 20% drop, which seems like a lot, and it is a lot, but uh, we're talking about container pricing dropping from 25,000 to maybe 20,000. I'm hoping it continues to go down. I really hope it goes down to around 10,000. I don't know if it'll ever go down to the three to 5,000 rates that were available before uh, the pandemic and in particular before, um, before about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. I don't know if that'll ever happen, but I'd love to see it around 10,000. I think reasonably it might get down to around 15,000, but I don't know if it'll ever go that much lower. As for speed, uh, this is the, the little bit of news that I had to, to share today. It's not great news, but it's um, hopefully it isn't something that you were planning around all that much. Um, freight shipping, it's still kind of erratic. We've seen some containers come in really fast, but it's this ebb and flow of containers being shipped from China in particular to the U.S. or other places in the world. And those containers then get shipped back to China. And depending on how quickly they get processed at either port, um, really matters, has a big impact on it. And I'm guessing there are some times where there, there's an influx of containers that arrive or depart and that creates some log jams. And so we've seen those shipping speeds increase by quite a bit over the last few months. But uh, I recently learned that some of the surprise products that I was hoping to reveal for our anniversary celebration in September did not leave until later than, uh, than they were supposed to leave. And I think... I think maybe they just didn't get on a container or, or on a ship that they were supposed to get on. And so they had to wait for the next ship. And we just found out about this yesterday. And so 
we have we had a few surprises planned for September, and my hope is still to share them with you in September for our anniversary celebration, our 10th year anniversary celebration. However, it's looking like that we will, and, and I don't know, this is very, infl- this is like something that we're discussing, I'm discussing with Joe and Alex right now. Um, but what I think will probably happen is that I will reveal those surprises to you in uh, on August 31st, and but not start selling them until they actually arrive. I, I don't like to sell things before they are actually in our fulfillment center. So um, you might get a couple, you might get two emails from us uh, in September, or technically one in August, I guess only one in September. You'll get one email from us on August 31st, and then one email from us sometime in the middle of September when we can actually reveal these surprise products when they're available. So that's a, that that's tied to the freight shipping issues. I don't think that, I mean, that could have happened in the before times as well, but at, it happened recently and it's been on my mind. So I wanted to let you know about that, that it is quite possible, highly possible that we will not, um, or that we definitely won't have these products in stock on, on August 31st, um, but it should be soon after. And most likely we will not start selling them until the middle of September. We'll see. Uh, that's what we're debating right now internally. Lots of questions today. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, James says, how are the cats? Uh, the cats are doing well at, None of the cats are in here right now. The weather has been actually really nice in St. Louis over the last couple of days, and so the cats have get, been getting some outside time, which they really enjoy. But he was outside at, at night after it got dark a couple nights ago for a couple of hours, which surprised me. It might be that I uh, didn't let him in when he really wanted to get inside, but he seemed fine out there. Daniel says, you eat with your hands off of the table. Do you eat my hand with my hands off of the table? Uh... No, I think I, I, I keep my hands on. Well, kind of. I, we, we eat most of our meals at the uh, while watching TV. So we're over like a coffee table. So I don't think my hands are really on that table. Uh, maybe that's a reference to something I said that I'm not getting here, Daniel. Carol says that she's headed to St. Louis for the next couple of days for probably the city museum, the zoo, and treats. Oh, that's awesome. Let me know which treats you decide on, Carol, while you're here. Kyle says, going to be reviewing Viticulture Roll this month. Awesome, Kyle. Thank you for reviewing that. Looking forward to it. Sorry, uh, sorry, my questions are a little disjointed. Facebook is doing the thing where it scrolls in the middle of me reading something. Um, he says, it'll be really interesting to take the game for a co-op spin, and I've heard it's quite a challenge. Yeah, it is. It is quite a challenge, indeed. Good luck with your first few plays of Viticulture World. Uh, Travis asked about the anniversary month. Hopefully I've kind of answered that question there. Travis, as far as I can answer it at this point in time. Um, sorry, this Facebook thing is driving me crazy. Michael says, did I receive my copy of Cat in the Box? Uh, I did. I did. And I'm playing it for the first, playing my copy for the first time at game night tonight. So I'm really looking forward to getting that to the table. It's been a couple months since I played a very early Origins copy. And yeah, so I'm really excited. It's literally on the table on the opposite side of this this wall ready to play tonight at game night. Genway says, I'm currently playing Viticulture on Board Game Arena and uh, their coins, more visitors and visitors from the Rhine Valley are coming today to complete my copy. That's awesome. A full copy of Viticulture will be on your table soon. I hope you enjoy those different those different modules, the more visitors, which can be shuffled in onto all your visitor cards or Rhine Valley, which is a separate set of Viticulture, uh, visitor cards that you can use when playing Viticulture. Alex says that he just spent 15 days in South Africa. We saw huge numbers of animals and special and especially birds. Can't wait for the Africa expansion for Wingspan to compare our shots with the art. What is the next continent for Wingspan? The next continent we've actually already announced it. We announced it a couple months ago, Alex. It is Asia. Wingspan Asia is the expansion that's coming up. Uh, depending on how freight shipping works out, it should be in a few months. Um, we should we will probably do the announcement, uh, the full reveal announcement in early October. We've started to reveal a few of the birds. You can see our website for that, and then. And uh, hopefully in early November, we'll run the pre-order. But don't hold me down to those dates. It depends heavily on freight shipping at this point. The Excel Gamer says, I saw your video a few days ago talking about Inscription and really enjoyed it. And really enjoyed it. The Inscription is one of the rare digital games that I played or that I play or that I played. And so I did a video on that. I also have a video about Dicey Dungeons coming out pretty soon. The Excel Gamer says, what are, some of the, what are some video games or video game series that have influenced you the most as a board game designer? I feel like Stardew Valley might have been one. Most video games, I uh, Stardew Valley 
has had a small impact on me. Um, I I mostly like watch videos about video games to learn from them. I, it's rare that I actually play digital games and that they have a direct impact on me. But uh, for my open world game that I've been working on for a while, there are a number I've like I've been trying to emulate the feel of many open world video games in uh, this in this tabletop game. And so I've done a lot of research about some of the best open world games out there. Games like uh, uh, Breath of the Wild, Zelda, the Zelda game, Elden Ring more recently, The Witcher 3, Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption, um, and Stardew Valley has actually played a little bit of a role because Stardew Valley, while it's not an open world game, it is a sandbox game and a lot of sandboxy and open world elements overlap. So that is one of the games that I looked into um, while working on my, my open world game. <clears throat> George says, I, I, I've teached... I've taught Viticulture World to a small group on Monday. Thanks for the great video on how to teach. It was quite useful and practical. Thank you, George, for saying that. Thank you for teaching it. And yeah, last Thursday, I put out a video about how to teach Viticulture World. That's on our YouTube channel. And tomorrow, I have a video about how to teach Rolling Realms, which I think got kind of got... Usually, I do that right after we release a game, but it kind of got lost in the shuffle because I was actively teaching how to play Rolling Realms on an ongoing basis on my video series, my live play series. But I thought, you know, why not? Why not have a video out there for those who want to learn how to better teach, or one way to teach, not better teach, but how to, one way to teach Rolling Realms. That video will be live tomorrow. I also did a video this past weekend about um, character creation in, in uh, tabletop games. Uh, whether you create characters entirely from scratch, like in Dungeons and Dragons, or if you shuffle together a few different elements that are kind of pre-made or pre-constructed for you, or if characters are completely pre-made, um, and you kind of learn about their, their backstory and tell their story as you play the game, or learn about their story as you play the game. There's three different methods. I explore them pretty in depth in this past Sunday's video, if that's something that interests you. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, I, I feel like I had something else to say there, but I've, I forgot. Oh, Rolling Realms, I wanted to mention that I do have a live play starting on Friday. I'll do a Friday, Saturday, Sunday session this week, and I also have book club tomorrow. If you want to join, join this same um, Stillmeyer Games uh, a Facebook page tomorrow at three o'clock central time. We have chapter nine that we'll be discussing in a crowdfunders strategy guide. Also, that reminds me, the visual that I wanted to show you today is I did a recent blog post about how we have some recent, uh, well, not recent, some ongoing eco-friendly efforts that are now finally coming to fruition. So in upcoming reprints of Wingspan and various expansions, you will start to see this container uh, this version of the box, this is pulp sugarcane instead of plastic. As you can see, it, it functions very similar to, uh, similarly to the plastic box. It looks very similar. It actually has a smaller footprint because um, plastic has like an extra edge that goes down here. We didn't need that for this. Um, it even has like, the. it's not quite as detailed as the plastic, but I don't know if you can kind of see on camera here, but it has the imprints of the bird uh, card backs and the bonus card back um, right here. And it has the lid. The lid still functions exactly the same as it does in the game. It does not, so this is one of the problems with plastic. It does not, again, with nothing in here, this lid snaps closed on this container. But with uh, with cards in here, you have to be a little bit careful. It doesn't snap, like it, it, it may come loose in the box. So you might need to make sure there it's packed tight with stuff on top of it so this lid doesn't pop off. That's one of the problems of exploring this pulp method opposed to plastic. Lids just aren't as good um, for this method. We also have uh, a couple of the other reveals. So we have, we've been using these and they're becoming more, more and more widespread in our games. These are biodegradable plastic bags made from corn, I believe, so they're corn based. The containers in Wingspan and some of our other games, instead of being plastic containers, they'll be these two part containers here that just hold components on the tables, particularly uh, components like eggs that tend to roll around on the tables, but you can put anything in them. We'll include two of these in, uh, in Wingspan. Um, and they feel really nice. I, re I really like the smooth feel of the inside of them. Again, they, lids don't work with these, so we didn't even try to put a lid on these because I think they would come loose immediately. Um, but you can keep them in the bag like I have here. You can kind of see I have all these eggs in the bag itself. And that is the last development. Wingspan eggs, since the beginning, have been plastic. I think many people think that they're wood, but they're not. And we've replaced the plastic eggs now with wood eggs, which uh, I didn't know that we could do to copy so precisely to the plastic versions, but these are the same size, the same shape, the same um, the same color, 
and, uh, and they, like, they look and feel exactly the same as the, the plastic eggs. The only difference that you can kind of tell is the plastic eggs are very slightly heavier, but it's very, very slight. The eggs still look and feel the same. So all future copies of Wingspan will have these wooden eggs instead of plastic eggs. So we've basically removed um, all non-biodegradable plastic. There is a, a few bags in there from Wingspan, which is a goal that we, we've been trying to accomplish for quite some time now. And uh, other than shrink wrap. Shrink wrap is the last piece of the puzzle that we're still working on, but we are actively working on that, or Panda is actively, actively working on that. And I'm just excited. Oh, and also part of the blog post that I wrote about last Thursday is that we are now using all FSC certified wood sources. So that means um, F the FSC, FSC doesn't always do this perfectly, but their job is to ensure that forests around the world are harvested or forested sustainably so that uh, wood is one of the amazing resources in this world and that it grows back, unlike the natural resources you use to make plastic. And so FSC kind of certifies that these forests are doing their job to, to do sustainable forestry. And now Panda is using all um, FSC certified wood sources. If you ask for it, you have to ask them for it. They can do either way. Um, you can pay a little bit more like we are doing um, to get those, those sustainable wood, so wood sources for both cardboard and wood. Yeah. That's a, that's a long summary of an article that you probably could have read faster than what I just did, but I thought you might want to see what we're working on here in terms of um, manufacturing things. We still want to make plenty of things that bring joy to your tabletops, but doing so in a sustainable way. Travis says he picked up Architects of the West Kingdom based on your appreciation of the game. Thanks for sharing. Oh, I hope you like that, uh, Travis. I love Architects. It is my favorite game from, from Garp Hill Games. Diego says, Beyond, besides Panda, are there any main recommendations you could mentioned for board game manufacturers. Diego, I do have a, a list on my website for other manufacturers for you to consider, but um, but they're the one. I mean, I, I love every aspect of Panda. I love their communication. I love their sense of responsibility and sustainability, as you can see with the eco-friendly efforts. Um, I like their quality. I like their pricing. So they are the only manufacturer. I've, I've only worked with one other manufacturer ever, and I wouldn't recommend them, and so I don't want to bring them up here. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I I, I really love working with Panda and I would highly recommend them. James says, uh, will Jamie, will there ever be a, oh, sorry, Facebook scrolled past it. Let's see. Will there ever be a Wingspan World expansion? Wingspan World. Uh, you might have to clarify what you're talking about that there, James. The plan for Wingspan is to have one expansion per continent. Yeah. Hey, are you maybe connecting it to Viticulture World? Like, are you asking, will there ever be a cooperative expansion for Wingspan? I think that is possible. Um, totally up to Elizabeth, though, if she does that. Garrett says, sorry, Facebook is being weird. Garrett, Garrett says, you could turn anniversary month into anniversary year with announcements throughout versus all instead of all at once. That's true, Garrett. We could spread them out a little bit, but I was hoping to have a bunch of fun stuff all at once. Um, and that, I think that's, I mean, that's still kind of the plan. The, the stuff is arriving at the same time, so we might as well do it. And then we have Wingspan Asia right after that. So we'd have to skip forward a few months afterward if we wanted to do that. And I, I don't really want to do that because we have Rolling Realms promos. Like we always have those to reveal now when we're looking for something fun to share. Justin says, I've heard if your design gets picked up by a publisher, they'll usually have someone act as a board game developer to help with your game. What would the role of the developer be? Um, Justin, yeah, great question here. The developer, uh, a developer helps you make a game as fun or helps a designer make a game as fun, intuitive, and balanced as possible. Um, those are the goals of, of, the, of the developer. And uh, typically, well, I don't want to say typically, it depends on the publisher, but the way we do it at Stillmire Games is I act as the developer for the games that we sign, and I actively work with the, the designer to, help, to facilitate that process. Usually that means the designer will send me a current version of the game, I will play it, I might run some blind play tests for it, I'll send feedback back to the designer, and they'll take that feedback, and they'll continue to shape the game based on that feedback and based on what they think is right, because they still know the game best. Um, it is not an entire handoff from a designer saying, okay, here's my game. Now you take it and run with it and do whatever you want with it. I think there may be some publishers that still do it that way, but I found the collaboration with the designer is much more fruitful. Dan is here. He says, um, I've not been around the last few weeks due to a tough time. In the last month, I lost my job and suffered very badly with COVID. I'm so sorry to hear that, Dan, um, on both of those accounts. 
Coming out of this horror time, time, I found my happy place playing Scythe and Charter Stone with my husband. So I wanted to say thank you for your games. Um, sorry, Facebook scrolled there. I wondered what your happy place is when times are tough. Most importantly, Dan, I'm, I'm sorry that you're going through those tough times. I'm glad that you found some joy on the tabletop during that time. Um, and I hope your recovery against COVID continues to go well. I hope it is starting to go well and that uh, you find joy in whatever your next job is and that you find that job. Um, my happy place, I have a couple different happy places. One is gaming. Um, one is that I try to keep a little limited is, is chocolate. I, I love I love sweets and desserts, but I try to keep that limited so that I'm not leaning on that um, uh, for, my health, for health reasons. My cats, I, I, you know, if I'm having a really down moment, I sometimes might kind of force my cats to cuddle with me a little bit. Obviously, I let them go if they're not into it. And, uh, and Megan, a good hug from Megan always, always brightens my day. So uh, those, those things definitely bring me joy from like little moments of joy to longer extended moments like playing a game I love. Also sports. I found that it really does help if I get outside. Uh, disc golf has been a great a source of joy for me over the last couple of years. Before that, it was climbing. Before that, it was soccer, ultimate frisbee. But uh, yeah, getting outside, getting my mind off whatever that is. It's only a temporary re reprieve. It's important, I think, for my mind to get back on those things to find a solution and, and work through them. But it does really help clear my head when I can go out and just focus on a on a sport for a little while, on an outdoor activity, whatever it is. Monique has a nice compliment. Monique says, love how transparent you are, Jamie, and how much you share with Stillmeyer fans. Oh, thank you for saying that, Monique. And and yeah, I I, I appreciate that. I, I That's that's the type of relationship I want to have with you and with everyone who decides that they want to support Stillmeyer Games. And really, any, anyone who doesn't want to support us either. I want to be transparent with them too. Oh, Chad says, I think eat with your hands off the table is referencing the crawfish low country boil. Oh, yes. Okay. I, I guess the, the clarification I should make there with the, the low country boil is you pour all this food on the table and you eat it with your hands opposed to eating with uh, utensils. That's the, the difference here. You get really messy. Your hands get really messy. Uh, okay, Carol says, just finished our fourth Sleeping Gods campaign last night and got our fourth different ending out of the 13. Love how there is still so much world and adventure to explore. Do you think, uh, do you think you'll go back to another campaign? I think it's f fairly likely, and that's awesome that you've found so much uh, replayability out of Sleeping Gods. There definitely is a ton of it in there. I think I will, but I also might... I might wait until the the sequel comes out and maybe play that and see if I want to replay that someday or re replay Sleeping Gods. But I can say, unlike many campaign games, Sleeping Gods is definitely still on my shelf. Um, it is rare, very rare, exceedingly rare that I'd want to replay a campaign game after playing it. But I think that's fairly likely with Sleeping Gods um, at some point. Or I'll just let more friends borrow it. Like my, I, I haven't, I've been letting friends borrow roleplayer adventures. I think my friend Paul still has that right now and because I might want to replay. I will not replay, but I might want to play if there's ever an expansion to it. I might want to do something else with that game because I loved it so much. We'll see about that. Chad says, I know you like to give the artist plenty of freedom for illustrating your games. Um, can you remember any piece of artwork that you gave a lot of direction so the final piece of art fit your vision? That's a great question, yeah, because I do try to give artists lots of freedom. Uh, but also the right amount of direction because some artists don't want uh, complete freedom. They, they want uh, some guidelines, some constraints. What's an illustration that I gave very specific directions on? Because really, I mean, the most comfortable place for my art direction is when the artist presents a few concepts and then I can riff off of them um, and play off of them. Uh, there's a recent, I, I mean, there's one that I can't say yet, but there's a box art that, that an artist is working on where seeing some of the things that this artist did gave me some ideas for how that art could, uh, could really reflect the theme of the game uh, that I hadn't thought of before. But what's an illustration that we've already done that wasn't that? Um, hmm. I don't know. It's really tough to think of because most of them are like I give very rough instructions and then my, my tighter revisions come after I see the concept. I can't think of something from the ground up that I was like, this very specifically needs to be here, here and here. I'm sure there is an example of that, but I can't think of it offhand. 
All right, before I scroll down, let's see what else is going on today. Uh, another blog post I did about on Monday about a note from the CEO that I received from, and it was a mass email. This wasn't a special note just for me, but it was it was personalized to my name. But it was from the 23andMe CEO after I signed up to learn more about my ancestry and my roots via 23andMe. Have any of you ever used one of those services to get a, a DNA test to learn about your, I guess, your health background and your ancestry? I think I kind of know that I have that I'm part German, Polish, and Irish, but I'm curious to see if uh, if this test contradicts those things a little bit. Very curious about that. But it, the post wasn't about that. The post was about a note I received from the CEO, kind of introducing me to why uh, she started 23andMe in the first place. I thought it was interesting, so I did a blog post about it on Monday. Also importantly, uh, today is the fourth birthday of my little scythe. My Little Scythe has its fourth birthday today. It still is incredible to me what Hobie and his daughter Vienna created for this game, and I'm very lucky and fortunate to be the publisher of it. It's kind of, uh, you know, two games in, the, in not the side of the world, but side like games so far in the Stomar Games universe. And uh, yeah, today's the anniversary. So I put My Little Scythe for sale on our web store if you don't already own it. And if you do get My Little Scythe on our web store and you add uh, the expansion Pie in the Sky to your cart, uh, that will also be on sale now um, if you if you add them together to your cart. So just a fun thing. If, you, if you're curious about My Little Scythe, if you want to play this family game that we have that is kind of like Scythe, but uh, is lighter and faster, but also a lot of fun. Like really, really, I, I really, really enjoy this game. Feel free to check it out. It's on our web store now. And it is back in stock. We had the core game out of stock for a while. It's back in stock now. Monique says, I can't wait for the African Wingspan expansion either. Hopefully the African Ringneck Bird uh, will uh, is included. Had one of those as a family member for nearly, nearly 30 years. Cody was his name. You're an African Ringneck named Cody. That's really cool. Make sure, Monique, if you haven't already, go to the Wingspan page of our website. And on that page is a form where you can recommend birds that you'd like to see in Wingspan, future expansions. So if you don't mind putting the ring neck there, uh, that would be great. That can, can increase the chances that it will end up in that expansion. Elizabeth really, really does use those lists to determine which birds end up in expansions. Cynthia says that she played Honey Buzz this week and, uh, and loved the art. All the board... All, the, all over the board are cute, fun little scenes of bees and other animals doing different things. I found it, sorry about my pauses, Facebook is like literally scrolling in the middle of, uh, while I reply. Um, let's see, I found it really enhanced my enjoyment of the game. How much does the art of a game influence your desire to play that game? Is it a big factor? It definitely invites me into the game when I learn about the game for the first time. If the art is beautiful or different or evocative, that invites me in. And it, I think it does have an impact on my delight as I play. I definitely get that feeling in Honey Buzz, I, that delight as I play. I get to see uh, what this what this little world is on the board. Um, I was just thinking about this for the game Sulkin the other day. Uh, I think Sulkin's board is really, really beautiful. It has a lot of detail, a lot of things going on on the board, but it doesn't get in the way of the graphic design. I think that's really, really great when, when those two things uh, relate to each other. And it... One little thing, this doesn't have a huge impact, but I like in games when I don't have anything to do, I've already planned out my turn, I know what I'm going to do in the game, that there's something else for me to look at. Whether it's flavor text, I can I can read some flavor text, whether it's story or narrative text, or if they're just like little artistic details that I can look for, little Easter eggs and things like that that I can look for on the board when I don't have anything else to do during downtime in the game. It makes downtime go faster for me when that happens. Can any of you think of games like that where you... Uh, you continually find new little Easter eggs or new little elements, new little moments of joy or delight in the art itself during those downtime moments of the game. Um, there are definitely quite a few of them in, in on my shelf, but uh, Everdell has them. Actually, Everdell has quite a few. I just played Everdell uh, a week or so ago, and that has quite a few little tiny things in the art that are worth worth looking out for. Nico. Uh, Nick, I'm sorry, just realized it's uh, Stomire's 10th year anniversary. Are you doing anything special? Yeah, I, announced, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I'll reiterate it. Um, we are doing things in September, or at least that's the current plan. We're doing things in September for our 10th anniversary, including some surprises that currently is looking like I will announce those surprises on August 31st, but we won't actually start 
having them on our web store because they are some things to to buy maybe something to get for free too maybe some discounts we'll see um those things won't actually happen for a few more days i think into september because there are a few a few of those products are arriving a little bit later than we'd hoped uh, we thought they were going to get there in time but it looks like now they won't arrive until the first or second week of september so we are doing some cool stuff and either way i think i'll reveal what that cool stuff is on august 31st for that 10th anniversary celebration see some nice comments here from people who are excited about the eco-friendly changes that we're making thank you for supporting them we are not passing on those costs to you but i love your support of them and i think other publishers will hopefully hear that support and maybe give some of these things a try as well um, yeah, so they do cost us a little bit more, but we're not passing on that to you in the form of the price that you pay for our games. Daniel says he's trying out the game My Father's Work. I'm very curious about that. I've seen a lot of good buzz about that game recently. Michael says we're planning to have a Rolling Realms tournament. Do you have a suggestion on how to audit the final scores? Hmm. You know, Michael, I would just use the main method of Rolling Realms of... Uh, of uh, making sure that everyone's using the same realms at the same time and the same dice and just add up the scores at the end. I think that's uh, I think that's a good way to do it. Are you thinking about doing something a little outside the box that might uh, that might conflict with that balance? Let me know. We can we can talk about it. Paul says his wife and him played Scythe for the first time over the weekend. First time. That's awesome, Paul. Welcome to the Scythe community. He says it was great fun to play. We now own Wingspan with all expansions, Viticulture in Tuscany, and the base game of Scythe. What should we go for next? Well, first, if you're exploring Scythe, have, maybe have fun with that for a while, because there's a lot in Scythe to discover through the different factions, the different player mount combinations with the factions. So have fun with that for a while before you jump on to the next thing. If you do like all those games, I mean, you've mentioned a bunch of engine builders there. Wingspan, Viticulture, Scythe, they're all engine builders. Tapestry is definitely another big engine builder. Um, and he says, but there are many great looking expansions for the Stormwire games we own. That's true. Yeah, you could go expansions for some of the, like Scythe has lots of expansions, so lots of ways to expand Scythe. There are other Viticulture expansions that, um, beyond Tuscany. Um, yeah, so I would, I would maybe start with expansions and then after that go to Tapestry or Pendulum. There, there are two other engine builders that we have in our, in our, uh, in our portfolio. Yeah, yeah, I'd go that route, Paul. Thanks for asking about that. Steve says, so the game will slowly disintegrate while on your shelf. And yeah, that's a little bit of a misconception about the biodegradable bags. These are very durable, durable bags. They will biodegrade um, in the same way that anything will biodegrade over time. If it's, you know, if it's just kind of sitting around in the, in the ground. Basically, if it gets buried, it's going to biodegrade uh, fairly quickly. If it isn't buried, if you keep it in your game box, it will stay intact for a long, long time. Um, but the difference is between this and plastic. So this bag will will last a long time but it will biodegrade it'll it, it's even compostable um opposed to plastic which is never going anywhere it's going to be around for a long long time and it, when it does finally finally biodegrade it'll leave microplastics that get into our bodies and into our water and into our food get, they get everywhere so um yeah yeah a little a little miscon misconception there steve but thank you for the opportunity to clear that up corey says i had another publisher uh, they have two other published games so far. Reach out to my page about sending me a prototype to take into the community to teach and play, do some video reviews on it, etc. prior to their Kickstarter campaign. What's your perspective as a publisher on important things to bring up in these types of videos and such that may not be obvious? Anything that you recommend focusing on? Oh, that's a, that's a good question, Corey. I don't, uh, I mean, I, I guess I, as from a publisher perspective, you know, it's been years since I sent out non-final games for review that's one of the advantages of of using the the stillmeyer method of of making a, a product before sending it to reviewers opposed to sending a prototype but uh i think one important thing for you to point out as as you do this is um is that you did receive a review prototype and that it is a prototype that it isn't a final version of the game i think that's important to point out um important things to bring up in these videos huh I don't know. I think, I think Rado does it really well. Well, Rado will will show some some gameplay. So he'll show some gameplay. That's kind of the preview portion of it. And then he'll share his thoughts on the game. And in those thoughts, he doesn't hold back. Like he really does share uh, things that he wish wishes will change. Because and this is one of the cool things about previewing a game or re, pre, uh, 
reviewing, I guess, an early version of the game, is that you can truly have an impact on the final version of the game uh, if the publisher is open to hearing your thoughts on it. So don't hold back with those things. And don't. I, I, I would suggest not feeling bad about saying things that are more constructive. Uh, not that you should ever feel bad about that when you're doing a review. Um, but in particular, like this is a time for you to truly improve the game. Like they're treating you essentially as a play tester here, which is uh, up to you whether or not you want to take on that role as you're doing this. But yeah, your your input can have a, a impact on the on the final product. So think about that as you're as you're vocalizing that and the way that you talk about talk about this this game that you're previewing. At the same time, keep in mind that your job is not to play test for another publisher unless you were signing up for that job and maybe being compensated for that job. And so I'd recommend figuring out what feels right to you and your valuable time as you choose to do this. Uh, is the publisher asking you too much? Are they asking you to do something that is not your role here? Maybe, maybe not, depending on what role you want to take on. Uh, yeah, I mean, from what you said, they're asking you to take that out into the community. Almost says they're, it sounds like they're asking you to, pr to promote the game which is, I, I don't know, I, I don't really see that as the, as the role of a reviewer. The role of a reviewer is to offer their unbiased opinion about a product to their audience. So figure out what boundaries feel right to you there. Maybe this is an experiment. Maybe you can figure out through this process what feels right and what feels a little weird um, so you can carry that knowledge forward. Well, I'm getting to these positive comments about the eco-friendly choices that we're making recently. Ari says, when will the wine crate for viticulture be available again? We are making it for 2023. So we are, are close to starting a reprint for it. It should be available in about six to seven months. So make sure to sign up for a back in stock notification on our web store if you're interested in getting it. Johnny says, I missed the start of the feed. Did you give any spoilers for Rolling Realms? No spoilers today for Rolling Realms, but I after the on the day three of my last two uh, Rolling Rooms videos, I did reveal um, I, I upcoming promo packs. So the first one I revealed was A Feast for Odin, and then the second one I re revealed was Honey Buzz. So we have, I didn't say when they're going to happen, but I did show final uh, printed versions of those, uh, of the, the packaging for those those realms at on day three, round three of each of my last two games of Rolling Rooms. My next game of Rolling Rooms will be this week. Um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and this is one where I won't reveal the realm because it coincides with a surprise that I'm not ready to reveal yet. Yeah. Monique says that she's also trying the Ancestry DNA test soon. I mentioned earlier that I'm doing the 23andMe and I asked if anyone else is doing it or has done it. I'm curious what your thoughts are on it. They've asked me a lot of like, uh, lots of medical questions. I think I think they're really trying to use this information or have been for quite some time. I'm, I'm late to the party, but they're trying to use this information to hopefully help help figure out what all of our DNA means. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm curious to see what, what comes of that. Chris says, King Domino has some really fun Easter eggs and I love how all the tiles are different. And Daniel says, I always find Easter eggs in the scythe player board. Um, just think when when you just when you think you found them all yeah especially the uh the the board itself not the player mats but the, the board that all players share there are a lot of easter eggs in there i have some of them on our website but a lot of them are for there for you for, to discover carlos says i'm designing a game that has a deck building aspect in it with multiple options actions and cards and i'm stuck with a problem what to do with cards that i draw from the deck that don't help me progress in that point of the game what do you recommend doing with these useless cards at that point uh, Carlos, deck building is an enigma that I have yet to solve, but I think one of the things that many deck builders do is to build a default resource into those cards where even if you don't have an action in that card that you can use that given time that you can discard a card or you can spend a card to use to pay for an action, basically. Um, and if you don't have anything like that, you could also have it where you discard a certain number of cards to draw a card. But, uh, but I think the resource option is typically the way to go there. Uh, where you're, you're spending that resource for something in the game that you can do on pretty much any turn. Um, I think that does help. Chad, says, uh, Chad also says that he loves the Easter eggs that Jakob put on the side board. I already mentioned Pillars of the Earth has fantastic art. It does. That's uh, uh, Michael Mendez, I think. 
uh, Michael Menzel. Menzel is one of the uh, classic, famous board game artists who still works. He did uh, Robin Hood, The Adventures of Robin Hood very recently. Also designed that. Okay, Michael is clarifying about his Rolling Realms tournament. He says, what I meant is we're thinking of how can we validate the scores? Since it's a tournament setting, we just want to ensure the resources were used properly and no mistakes, unintentional or intentional, were made in applying dice results and creating virtual dice. I think that's really difficult to do, Michael. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if it is possible to do that. I think to a certain extent, you're going to have to trust the players. And with that in mind, you might, if you do have a prize for the tournament, Make it not a lot of money. Like if you made it a $10,000 prize for the tournament, you would probably have people who might fudge a few things in the game um, to try to get to that prize. But if it is a, I don't know, a $20 gift card or a $30 game, then people are just there for the fun of it. They're just there for the pride. The prize is kind of just a bonus on top. I don't think anyone will, will cheat purposely there. Or, or, you know, unintentionally it's going to happen. People are, are going to make unintentional mistakes. What you might want to have, though, is a rule in place for someone who figures out or realizes that they made a mistake. Um, I can't remember if I have something in the rule book about that, but you might just want to have something like that in mind, where you say, okay, if you make a mistake and you own up to it, uh, here's a, a, a small penalty that you'll incur. Like, you'll lose a resource um, and then move forward with it. I think that might be, might put everyone on the same page of owning up to any mistakes that they make and not feeling bad about it themselves because they might feel bad about it. Molly says that Castles of Mac and Ludwig and Dog Park are both on their way now. Are you just excited for both? I'm very excited for both. I didn't even know that, Molly. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I, I have some packages on their way to be delivered today, so I wonder if those are among them. I am, I am super excited. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I backed both. Uh, this is the deluxe version of Castles that that uh, backed a couple of years ago now, and Dog Park, which I backed last year. Ooh, yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you for sharing that. Garrett says... Uh, how often, if ever, do you playtest games that Stillmire Games has no involvement in? Very rarely. And I kind of always feel a little guilty about it, but, uh, you know, I still work 70 to 80 hours a week on Stillmire stuff. And when I'm not doing that and I play a game, I just want to have fun with it, typically. Yes, I'm always learning from the designs of published games, but uh, playtesting the game is a lot of work. Um, it is not just learning the game and playing it, and the game probably doesn't work as well as, as a published game, but uh, but also I give pretty detailed feedback about games. I can spend hours, I can kind of get mixed up in, in spending quite a bit of time uh, in offering feedback by email or in person, depending on the play test. So uh, I'm so grateful for the people who play test for me, and that's why we compensate them. We play, we pay our play testers, but uh, it, it, I, I have, I found that I, I, it is not responsible for me as someone who really does need to focus on some of our games to do that for other games, to, to spend that energy and that time on other games. So it is exceedingly rare that I do that. Um, it's all too easy for me to just get wrapped up into it in the, in the, in the feedback process. And then a couple of hours have gone by and, and that's hours that I, I should have spent moving some of games forward, in my opinion. Zach says, how are things going for the third Tapestry expansion? They're going really well. Um, our graphic designer had some stuff come up this month that slowed it down a little bit, but uh, that's fine. We, I always put personal, family, health, I put those things always first before our games for anyone who's connected to Stonemaier Games. So uh, those things are coming first, and then when she's able to finish up the, uh, the graphic design for the expansion, we'll, we'll move forward with production. But it's going well. It looks great. Uh, George says, is the Tapestry playmat in full production now? It is indeed in full production now. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, production might almost be complete on it. The Excel Gamer says, I got a copy of the, the Transcontinental a couple days ago, a game called that. It's a train style game where, where instead of people having their own trains, there is a single train that everyone uses. I'm sure this has been done before in other train games, but it seems novel. What are your favorite games that have mechanisms that might be flipped on its head? One was actually mentioned earlier. This is one of the reasons I love Architects of the West Kingdom. In a lot of worker placement games, you spend time and effort getting more workers in the game. But in Architects, you start out with 20 workers. 
So you, you start out with all the workers that you'll ever need. There are times that you'll need to retrieve them, but it's just an abundance. It's this wealth of workers that you start out with at the beginning of the game. I love that. I think that is so clever in Architects of the West Kingdom, along with a lot of other cool worker placement stuff in the game. But that is the big thing that just totally flips that, uh, that classic element on its head. Um, I've tried to flip some things on the head in, in some of our games. Like in Euphoria, you can bump workers. There were probably games before that could, that could do that, but it, I liked the puzzle of finding a worker placement game where it still feels important to choose a space before someone else, but where that space doesn't block other players from choosing that action. And so having the, the, the mechanism where on your turn you're replacing or retrieving workers added to the bump mechanism where being bumped saves you a retrieve turn worked perfectly. It worked, I, well, I don't want to say perfectly, but it worked really well in Euphoria, and I've seen other games use that mechanism since then. So the idea that worker placement blocks everyone else is the thing that I tried to flip it on its head. Zach says, is there a potential expansion coming for Red Rising or is it the plan to still wait for the next book to be released? We are still indeed waiting for book six to be released before we dive headlong into the design of whatever comes next for Red Rising. If anything, we don't know for sure if it'll be anything. Pierce did recently announce that there isn't just a book six, there's also a book seven. But I think we will try to make the decision after reading book six. We're not going to wait then for book seven unless there's something about it. I mean, I think that the danger is that we say we do an expansion. Say we do like the, the easiest version of this would be to do an expansion with more characters, right? More characters that show up in books five, six, seven or four, five, six. And we do it after book six and then book seven comes out and there's another cool character introduced. I guess at that point we probably just have to say, okay, we'll just do a promo for that character. Um, to get them in the game. But uh, that, is, that is one version of like what we're thinking about here, why it would be nice for us to know all the information about the characters before we, uh, before we dive into what's next for Red Rising. But we'll see. I mean, it is quite possible that we will read book six and be like, okay, we cannot continue until we've read book seven. We need book seven to make a decision about what to do next. So we're not in a rush. We're going to take our time. We're going to try to do it right, whatever we do. And... Uh, We'll, we'll talk about it. Alex and I will talk about it after after book six. Let's see. Uh, Simon says, what can I share about the project titled Wild, about the development for Project Wild? Well, Simon, I don't talk about specific code names. Those are just for speculation, for people to, to speculate about. Um, I do talk about some of the, the products that we have in the works, but never in relation to their code name. Um, that, is, that is a secret that we maintain uh, a veil of secrecy that we maintain until we actually reveal the product. Chet says, not sure if this is the place to say this, but my wife and I are very excited because we're starting up the adoption process. That's awesome, Chad. Um, it's okay to share personal things here, things that are bringing you joy or, or excitement in your life right now. Chad says, a big part of finding a potential mother is networking. So if anyone knows someone thinking about adoption, please let me know. We promise to make tabletop gaming a huge part of their life. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. I, I love hearing that, Chad. Um, I love that you put that out there. It, uh, it, it, it hits home for me specifically because I, I was adopted um, when I was three days old. I, I'm very lucky to have my mom and my dad, my brother, my sister. Um, so yeah, I, lo I love that you're doing that. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a uh, for me, it was a very loving choice by my biological mother to to find a family. She she didn't feel like she was ready to to provide the life that she wanted for a child when she was when she was pregnant with me. And so I, I'm forever grateful for her choice. And uh, yeah, and grateful for for my parents for for taking me on too. So yeah. Um. Yeah, someone give it a little little huggy emoji here. I'm going to do the same because that, that's really beautiful. I want more than just a like. I want the huggy emoji. There we go. Um, so yeah, today I've talked about eco-friendly stuff that we're doing for for uh, for Wingspan and other games. Biodegradable bags, pulp sugarcane inserts and trays, wooden eggs, FSC certification for wood and cardboard. Um, talked about what other similar stuff that we talked about today. Uh trying to think of other questions I was answering so I can put them in the title of this video. I uh, talked about my little Scythe birthday today, another birthday. We had Scythe's birthday a couple weeks ago. 
news about the upcoming STEM Air Games anniversary. Um, not the news that I wanted to share, but want to be transparent with you about what's coming up next. And uh, yeah, those were the main topics for today. So uh, Simon says, how about the open world game that you said you're working on? Yes, I'm still working on it. It's a big, massive game, uh, this this open world game that I'm working on, cooperative open world game. And I actually was working on it this morning a little bit. It's a, it's a massive design. My commitment is to finish the design for it um, because a, a lot is, is going into the, to the design for this game. To finish the design for it by the end of this year and then um, get the development done and everything else done about the game in 2023. So we're probably looking at a 2024 release at this point. Uh, that's my goal. That's what I'm aiming for right now. Some nice comments that are probably going to bring more tears to my eyes if I read them out loud. So <laughs> I'm going to let that go. But there is, yeah, a lot, a lot of emotion here. It isn't something I think about a lot. Um, I, I've talked about it on my personal blog quite a bit because I, I want to remove any stigma from adoption. I, I, I see it as a... I don't know why there ever was stigma about adoption um, because it's such a it's such a selfless, loving choice for a parent to say, I can't handle this. I, I'm not ready for this um, and to make a choice that's uh, that's that's right for them and right for the child. I, I think it, it goes both ways. Um, and it's also an incredible choice for a family to say, uh, yeah, we, we, we want to do this. I know, I know a lot of parents try really hard to have kids biologically with each other. I admire that choice as well. Um, that was the case with my, my brother and sister. My parents were, had, had them biologically. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of an incredible thing. Um, and so I, I do talk about it on the blog, but I don't, it's not something that I, that I think about in my day-to-day -day life all that much. Um, uh, so it, when, when someone brings it up and wants to make that choice, it's pretty powerful to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, Molly. Yeah, I can't. I can't read the comments because I'm going to break down if I read these comments. But I think it's really beautiful that you all are thinking about that today. Um, yeah, thank you. Here's a non-emotional question from Josek. Josek, uh, for someone trying to break into the tabletop hobby as a career, what would you suggest for someone to get their foot in the door? Josek, I have an article about this um, about uh, about volunteering. I think volunteering is one of the most powerful ways to get your foot in the door. Pick out a few publishers that you really um, love and admire. I still have the emotion for I can't not think about the adoption thing now. But think about a few publishers that you love and admire and find out how their volunteer programs work and make yourself visible to them. Make yourself an active, visible volunteer for those companies. Um, and then keep an eye out for jobs within those companies. I like even on our on the Stonemaier Games job application, one of the questions now is what is your current connection to Stonemaier Games? And I will say that it is an advantage for those who say that they are an ambassador for Stonemaier Games. Please don't lie and say that you are if you aren't, but uh, that definitely has an impact. When I'm looking at people who I want to consider for jobs at Stonemaier Games, I want to look for people who clearly care specifically about my company, given how many other companies are out there. And I think volunteering is a great way to do that. Um, I do want to mention that uh, sometimes I think people hear volunteering and think, oh, publishers are just going to look for, for free stuff, for free time, free services. Um, but I don't think that necessarily always equates to volunteering. Volunteering is your choice to give of some of your time, some of your energy, some of your talent. If the company starts to ask you to do something for them, uh, that's when I think that company owes you some compensation for that. But if you accept, if you accept the task, but I think volunteering is something of your own free will to help someone else out because you want to, because you're excited about it. Um, and, and you don't expect anything in return, um, other than to maybe get your foot in the door a little bit. Like Molly here, Molly is extremely active in the Stone Mario Games Discord channel, just having fun there, but also answering questions. That's awesome. If Molly ever applied for a job at Stone Mario Games, Molly would absolutely stand out uh, for, 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 because I know that Molly is excited about Stone Mario Games and knows the company well too. That's another thing that happened with, happened with volunteering. You can really get to know a company's products and the people and their inner workings um, much better than you would as a complete outsider. You won't get to know everything. And maybe I need to do, as I'm saying that, I think maybe I need to do a better job of letting ambassadors know what goes on beyond the scene, behind the scenes so they can understand how to better represent what we're doing at some of our games. But, uh, but I think inevitably by volunteering, you will learn more about that. Um, yeah. Chad says, are there games that you heard about for the first time from the Gen Con coverage that you are interested in playing now? 
There are a few. I actually I knew very little about Elizabeth's game, The Fox Experiment. Elizabeth Hargrave, designer of Wingspan. I didn't know much about that, and that game looks awesome. I'm really intrigued by that now. And I'd already pre-ordered Clank Catacombs. So that wasn't one that I discovered through Gen Con coverage. What were any, let me look at the BGG hotness to see if there's something else that comes to mind. I think there was one other game where I hadn't heard of it at all. And then I heard of it from, from Gen Con. That was the main one. I think there's one other one that I'm forgetting, but I can't remember right now. Feel free to let me know what comes to your mind if there's, if there's one there that comes to your mind that I should uh, that I should remember. I don't think so. If any of you were at Gen Con, what did you pick up? Anything that you were really excited about that you picked up and maybe have tried since then? Uh, Genway says, on the subject of volunteering for publishers, would it count if you volunteer for them at conventions? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's a great way to, to even spend personal time with um, with the people who run the, the company or at least run the booth there. That's a great way. Absolutely. Genway also says that they tried the Fox Experiment at Gen Con. That's cool. Um. Yeah, I guess the one thing I'm thinking of, Genway, as you say that, is that I don't actually know, uh, because I wasn't at Gen Con, I don't even know the full list of volunteers that were at Gen Con that helped out with Stomar Games. And so um, I would like to see that list so I can know those names of people who actively helped out there. I will get that, that, that volunteer list just so I can be grateful for the, the people who contributed. Yeah. Oh, and Kat, Chad mentioned uh, that he was happy to hear that Cat in the Box was a huge hit at Gen Con. Yeah, I had no doubt that after playing that, that was going to be a huge hit. Can't wait to play the game night tonight. Tony says that shipping for Dog Park in the U.S. is for September. So it's, I guess it's getting to Canada a little bit earlier. All righty. I think that's it for today. Thank you all for moving me to tears today <laughs> and, uh, and for joining me for today's discussion. I always love your questions, your comments, your thoughts. Uh, this has been a great joy for, for my day, and I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Uh, yeah, or, or tomorrow if you're here for Book Club, or Friday if you're there for the Rolling Realms live play. One of the, one of the two, or next Wednesday. Take care, have a great day. I'll see you next week. Bye.